Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Matt Scott. In today's episode, we are so excited to share our early driving impressions of the Ineos Grenadier prototype. We were fortunate to be the first in the Americas to test an America's spec Grenadier prototype in technical terrain. We actually used it in the Uari National Forest at the Overland Experts Training Grounds. So enjoy our wide ranging conversation on the capabilities of the vehicle, how it compares with others in the segment and what we can look forward to with the Grenadier in the very near future. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. So Matt, today we get to talk about the Grenadier. We've been given the green light to talk about the green light. Our, the, yep, to we talk have about been our, green lit. We have to talk about our driving impressions with the Grenadier. We were actually the first in North America and all of the Americas to drive a an American America's spec yeah. Grenadier. So. I mean, I actually have the one that I drove yes, right here. Right. You have, we yeah. have one here in the U.S. It's, right uh, if you're not following us on YouTube's, um, this will make no sense. But it's actually your, it was your birthday present. It was my birthday present, you. yeah. And it's got like a little, the doors open. And yeah, exactly. It's very cute. <laughs> I, I actually kind of love it. It was, uh, it was one of the best birthday presents I've ever gotten. Yeah. And so... So I've driven the model of it. You've driven the real one. <laughs> and where did you drive it? North well, Carolina or you I did. I did, or? I did. But before we get started, um, Ooh, I, I <laughs> when we first sat down to have this conversation, I noticed that Matt actually has a Galandavagen t-shirt on, which you did not do intentionally. No, because I drove, I, I haven't driven my G-Wagon in like months. Yeah. And then I was like, this is clean. <laughs> and it's like this bougie car guy brand period. Correct. And it's cool. And I, I don't know, I, maybe I shouldn't have taken my sweatshirt off. I was just slightly <laughs> warm, but it's not, uh, I, I like it. And it's going to be relevant to the conversation because we're yeah. actually, we're going to have there's a little actually, bit of comparison between that. And, and I think there's a lot, there's a lot more in common between these vehicles. No than, question. Yeah. Um, especially with the association of Magnus Stare, who, um, you know, originally partnered with Mercedes to, to develop the G wagon for the exactly the shot of a run. Yeah. And that's part of what the fun is when you look at the Galandavag and you can tell it was assembled by someone who kind of was told make the best. Yeah. Was- Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who is the CEO and primary shareholder of the Ineos corporation. Yeah. And he is a lifetime traveler and overlander. And he, he's, he's ridden the length of Africa on a BMW. Yeah. He drove around all of the places with Defenders. And he had a love for the Defender model Land Rover. And when they decided to stop making the utility version and start making the mm. Scottsdale version yeah. of, the, of the Defender. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I it's, mean the that's where I see the defender's them. fine. I just like there's that totally. whole uh, it's a different intention trust thing that I don't really have anymore in it. Yeah, I mean, it went from being a utility vehicle to being an SUV yeah. option for a lot of folks. It's like um, it was going to be a discovery. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like it was supposed to be yeah. a discovery. So by. yeah, Jim, cool dude. Um, yeah, super basically, cool guy. Uh, and even try, he even tried to buy all the tooling. That's of where the, the whole thing Defender. started. That's right. Huge Defender fan, uh, lifelong traveler, as you said. Yep. And then Land Rover 
you know, it's like, here's the blank check. I want to buy the tooling and the rights to the fender. I want to keep making it. You're crazy for stopping and, exactly. you know, building this other thing. No. And, you know, then we got, yeah, we got the Grenadier. And I mean, that's what happens when you tell a billionaire no is uh, he's like, well, I, I'll just make, yeah. I'll just make my own. I think it's hard to not have a little bit of a man crush on the studio. I and mean, I just found out he bought, he bought Bell staff. He did. The, the cool thing with the Grenadier is what this guy's doing with the Ineos brand, which started as a, I mean, a petrochemical company. That's right. Chemicals company. And you can really see that the vehicle was developed with passion. Like there was, there was someone steering the ship who actually cared or, and actually had a vision where I think these days, so many cars get so watered down. I mean, I do think that, you know, Jeep does a really good job of preserving the Wrangler. Yes, um, absolutely. I, I absolutely. think that, um, you know, the Defender is maybe the example of, I don't want to say all show, no go, because the vehicle is actually very, very capable, but it was like, it, that vehicle always felt to me, okay, how can we make it appeal to as wide of an audience, um, but still be based on just every other Land Rover model? Yeah, it's just thing. the, it's the difference between a, a, a new model that was pushed by design and marketing yes. versus a new model that was pushed by enthusiasts and engineers. Yeah, there was a singular vision That's right. with, the, with the Grenadier, and that is why I'm so interested in it. That's why you're so interested in it. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think it's maybe important to say we're not trying to disparage the Defender, but it is inevitable that you make comparisons between the Grenadier and the Defender. Yeah, and uh, we need to. We need to talk about how does the Gren Grenadier compare to the original Defender, which we have one right behind you here. How does it compare to the new Defender? How does it compare to the G-Wagon? How does it compare to the 70 series? These are all really important questions. And fortunately, I just have so much time driving all of those and now the Grenadier yeah. that we definitely have some opinions around that, uh, which I think will be relevant. But the from the beginning, we have... Well, you have experience. I have opinions. I have, <laughs> I have nothing but opinions. You have lots of experience. Not with the Grenadier. I mean, you're, uh, you're, you're yeah, the dude I know. with that. Yeah. Well, I just, feel, just so, I feel so incredibly fortunate. Uh, and it's also really important to note that we weren't compensated in any way to go be the first to test the Grenadier. Uh, we received no compensation of any form, and Grenadier Ineos is not an advertiser. So... Um, just genuinely we excited just, we to were see just that extreme. vision. Yeah, it was a perfect it was a perfect fit with our experience and passion for the project um, and them wanting to have uh, an impartial um, yeah. journalist uh, review the product. Uh, it was a great it was a great fit. So yeah, we got a chance to to fly out to North Carolina. Uh, we went to the Uari National Forest, and there is a private inholding there that's owned by the folks at Overland Experts. And Overland Experts is one of the, it's like they're, <clears throat> they're right below the surface of what we see in popular overlanding uh, because they don't really need to promote themselves to the public space, but they're one of the most capable overland training testing and like kind of military support organizations out there. They do a lot of, of um, secret squirrel vehicle training stuff back east uh, and, a, and a hyper competent team of trainers and drivers. Most of them are ex-military. But because this is a, a private inholding where they have lots of buffer of, of land that gives it a lot of um, secrecy. They, they do a lot of testing of OEM vehicles and military vehicles there, including the Grenadier. So we go to the, we go to the Overland Experts facility and there's a bunch of prototype Grenadiers there. Uh, there were other people there that were unrelated to, to journalism. Um, there was some of the folks from 7P were there and some marketing team members um, related to Grenadier, but I was the only one there that got to talk about it, at least in a timely fashion. So yeah, yeah. Um, so what'd you think? Well, I think the for me that the immediate takeaway is that uh, there they have a it has a placard on the vehicle. It's actually right at the A pillar in front of the driver, and it says "built on purpose." Mm. 
And that is a fairly bold statement, and it also is something that is clearly the mission of the Grenadier, which is we're going to build a vehicle that's suitable for NGOs in developing countries, and we're going to build a vehicle suitable for adventure travelers and overlanders um, that want to do extreme remote travel. And it was built on purpose to do that. And when I drove it, I realized very early on that the vehicle very much was built to that specification, to yeah. that goal. And I'll, I'll give you some great examples of it. So when you sit in the vehicle, you're sitting on Recaro seats, which sounds very cool and very bougie, but there's a bunch of advantages to Recaro seats, but they are not electric in any way. Hmm. They are all manual Recaro seats. Less weight, less stuff to go wrong. Less stuff to go wrong. And if you're water forwarding, you're not getting all of those components wet, dirty, all the gears aren't getting dusty and filled with gunk or whatever else. An all mechanical Recaro seat. So a comfortable supportive seat that's lightweight. And that's an existing component, right? So as a startup company, yeah, they don't have to spend X gajillion dollars designing these components they're just real it seems to me that grenadier Ineos, they're relying on really trusted suppliers it seems like it yeah that's and that's a good that's a good approach uh, because you get to adopt all those learnings there's a lot of bosch components on their bmw components designed by magnus steyer in austria so there's a lot of like you said premium suppliers and collaborators that are involved so another great example is you sit in the vehicle and you look down and oh my goodness there's actually a an all mechanical parking brake this hmm. is 2023 yeah like my my truck doesn't have a mechanical parking brake not even one that you it's apply you with a foot <laughs> that's true but it, it, <laughs> like they're all that way they're all either not foot, my ram but it's a foot brake yeah it's a foot one which the what we want what we want is a mechanical handbrake yeah if it's snowy and you have a parking lot by yourself a, a mechanical handbrake with your hand hand yes. brake a lot more fun than the one with your foot that's right well there's a lot of reasons for it they are more fun cuz you can yeah. get the vehicle especially in this configuration which is different from a land rover the parking brake is on the rear axle so if you have the the center differential open and you apply the handbrake you're going to initiate the vehicle rotating, oversteering, um, mm. drifting the vehicle, using the handbrake. Um, in a Land Rover, it's always funny when people tried to do that because it was on the transfer case. So, yeah. <laughs> so it had a very different effect. Oh, um, yes, the LT230. <laughs> yeah, so it has a mechanical handbrake. It has a cable-activated transfer case with high range and low range and then an open center differential in the transfer case that can be locked in either high range or low range. Hmm. So very much like uh, the, Lan the Land Rover transfer cases. But it's an actual lever connected to a cable that runs down a cable and to a, a physical transfer case. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, which is, you, you which is built that, by Tremec. That is something that you don't see. Which it's is built by Tremec. Tremec. So yeah. it's a Tremec transfer case. It's about 2.5 to 1 low range, which is plenty low when you combine it with the 5. I think it's a 5.4 to 1 first gear in the trans transmission okay. that's actually not finalized. Yeah, that's a ZF8HP, <clears throat> which it is. if anybody has heard me geek out on automatic transmissions, that is the that's one the that's one. trusted from... It's where Rolls-Royce and Bentley agree. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, let's, so great, let's, great let's, transmission. Let's talk about that 2 to 5 to 1 thing because there's going to be somebody here with a... You know, with a Rubicon or something, I'm like, oh, are my Jeep's better than that. I'm like, yeah, that's that's cool. You know, like for some scenarios, lower is better. But I actually find like two to five, two point five to one. That's what's in you know the G wagon, for yep. example. I think the Defender's two point seven seven to one in the LT two yep. thirty. Anything lower than that, and like you almost end up with too short of gearing, um, particularly in reverse. That's where the the if you've ever driven a, a Rubicon Wrangler in the dunes or in the mud or yeah. in the snow, uh, the four to one transfer case is actually a liability. And initially, the four to one transfer case or these very low transfer case gears, 
they they actually made a ton of sense because you had these were Toyota mini trucks and and Land Cruisers and you know vehicles that either had a four speed automatic yeah. with a very tall first gear or they had a manual transmission and having a four to one with and a they, manual makes and, a ton and they of didn't sense. have the same power curves like That's right. you know it's not about it's not always about how much torque or how much horsepower the vehicle makes oftentimes it's where it makes it and i think that that's what's yeah, so fascinating absolutely. about the engine that they've chosen which is in north america we're just going to get the b58 which is the the gasoline version but they're both from a bmw derivative b77 diesel b58 petrol and i want to say that they're un- running their own proprietary simpler bosch um, electronic control they make power so low and they have this flat torque curve and that you turbo. don't have to have turbo four to one too. you know like, let's say that you have your pentastar and the yep. and the and the rubicon well that doesn't one the engine doesn't really make much torque and it makes all of its torque very high up um yeah, that's true fa- factor when, when you take everything in i think for utility use <laughs> yeah four to one in this application would actually be a negative uh, this vehicle has a 50 to 1 low range with an automatic, which is absolutely perfect. Yeah, um, It's very clear. It, and this has nothing to do with the Grenadier. It, this is just in the same way that 50 to 1 is perfect with an automatic, 75 to 1 is perfect with a manual. Closer to 100 is even m- better for extreme rock crawling. Um, and it's the same reason why we want to have a tire diameter that's twice the wheel diameter. These are these are basic functionalities of a vehicle that make them perform exceptionally well in the conditions that we like to travel in. So 50 to one is ideal with an eight speed automatic, 5.4 to one first gear, it's plenty low. Um, I did a lot of left foot braking in the technical terrain on this course and there was no shortage of crawl ratio, both for descending and for ascending. I'm just, I'm just excited about it. Yeah, it's super. You know? It's super cool. I mean, it's super cool. I think BMW, like the BMW, like it doesn't. It shouldn't even exist in 2023. But yeah, somehow we it does. That. Somehow like, it does. It's, it's pretty cool. On, you know, the, I, I think the one area that I'm a little bit skeptical of, is, is are the, they're the BMW power plants. Mm. You know that, but BMW has been making straight six engines for a really long time. There's an advantage to an inline motor. I mean, you have, I'm not going to say half the moving components, but you have one head gasket. You know, you've got one set of valves. You have one camshaft. Well, maybe you have two camshafts because dual sure. overhead camera or whatever. But yeah, sure. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's simpler. It's easier to work on. There's less components to fail. There's one manifold. They tend to run cooler manifolds. as well. Yeah, they're very smooth. Yeah, very um, smooth. You know, I, I have confidence in this engine because, you know, Magnus Stare, who as I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, was an engineering partner is That's the correct. term. That's correct. Development and engineering partner. Yeah, right. so Magnus Terra was a few things. They're an engineering company. They're a manufacturing company. On the engineering side, that's that's where Ineos uh, uh, partnered with them. On the manufacturing side, and I, and I guess the, the engineering side, you know, that's where the G-Wagon came from. That's right. Right? Uh, back then, it wasn't Magnus Terra. Magnus was a Canadian company that bought into... Uh, I think it was Steyr Push at, at yeah. the time. I mean, they've made everything from like the Steyr Aug, you know, assault <laughs> rifle. To, totally. Um, the Pinsgauer, the Halflinger. Um, and the G-Wagon. Yep, that's right. The G-Wagon. They're also a contract manufacturer. So this is a service that they offer. They have, again, going back to from an outside perspective, that 10,000 foot view, they've really chosen kind of the right people to assist them on this Um you know, the, the Evoke that we drove in yeah. Greece was going to be built at the Magnus Terra plant. They're kind of like this contract manufacturer that's good at doing specific models and turning things around uh, 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 very, very quickly, yeah. right? Um, they build the Supra. Well, and that was, when you mentioned that, that, I found that to be very interesting. So those that are listening that are Toyota fans, they're going to really hang their hat on reliability. Yeah. And so you have the, the company that designed and built the G wagon. You have the company that now manufactures the Toyota Supra. And as I understand it, based on the way that you described it, there are a lot of similarities 
between that engine. Between the engine in the Grenadier and the engine in the Supra. So Toyota is not going to use a motor that doesn't have at least and they use the fundamentally same transmission. Now, I mean, to be fundamentally fair, the, great. the Supra is a BMW Z4 underneath. Yeah, sure. Right. Um, you know, again, what I'm getting at is this is a drive line where, where I'm starting to get confidence back in it. And it's um, been around a while as well. Because right. the problem, as you were saying, is the cars have maybe not gotten reliable. We're, we're, no, BMW we're, had some dark ages. I mean, if you look at, I mean, I remember reading an article where they were comparing a 20-year-old Lexus reliability against a two-year-old BMW. Yeah. And it was like the 20-year-old Lexus was more reliable by a wide margin. So obviously BMW is trying to address that. And if you look at some of their reliability numbers, they are improving yeah. in a lot of ways. But that is what I think you make a valid point. You have this vehicle that is very simple, very austere, minimal systems, as minimal systems as they can possibly have that, that DOT. And yeah, and, and let's touch on that too. Like everybody wants you know, a series, like not everybody, but there's a contingent of people out there that seem to be very vocal and don't maybe necessarily seem to be new vehicle purchasers, right? Like that's, that's something that I've mentioned before is yeah. that, um, there's people who have opinions on new vehicles and there's people who buy new vehicles. Yeah. New vehicles have to be manufactured for those that buy them, not that those that have opinions on them. Right. Um, so it brings, uh, to, to finish off the engine thing, they've worked with that platform before. Yeah. You know, it's a tried and true engine gearbox combination. You know, I mean, in 2023, now that we're in that, you know, the rest of it, the body, the, the axles, the driveline, the frame, that kind of stuff, that's not that sophisticated anymore. In yeah. In the fact, this is intentional. This is intentionally unsophisticated, yeah. which I actually, yeah. so this is a body on frame vehicle. Yeah. How rare is that to find in an SUV? It's got solid front and rear axles, which is something that we always ask yep. for. And the price point isn't really that bad. No, if you do some comparisons between vehicles, like if you were to compare a 200 series Land Cruiser in the UK to a 200 series Land Cruiser that was sold here in the US. Um, it looks like that this vehicle is going to come in in the high 60s to the high 90s yeah. as a range, uh, maybe even the low 60s. So uh, that in if you look at how much cars cost today, that's yeah. a hell of a deal. Well, so you have, I mean, just to branch out into competing vehicles, you have the Wrangler. Um, great vehicle. Yeah, I had a Gladiator. I really, really appreciate them. They have the benefit of huge volume. I mean, they will make quarter million Wranglers a year. Yeah, yeah, they'll, they make they make huge numbers. So you're able to get that economy of scale. You know, those are anywhere realistically mid to high thirties to seventies now. I yep. mean, we have. Oh yeah, there's hundred thousand dollar Wranglers. There's hundred thousand dollar Wranglers. Three ninety two. Yeah. yeah, if you want them. And then on the far end of the spectrum of body on frame vehicles, you have the G wagon. So if you're going to try and get a G wagon, the really cool thing, now you can get the professional package. It's a little bit of a watered down professional package, but realistically it's appropriate for what the G 550 is. So I just, I was looking at one. It's $189,000. Yeah. You're not if kidding. you could get it. If you could get it right by the time you build it out and you do the professional pack and you do like maybe a cool color like the uh, um, the tan yeah. the tan or they do the you know the kind of the the little the weird blue and and whatever so you, you you have these two opposite ends of the spectrum and I think when you consider that you're getting an Austrian built vehicle with German components and all of these key players involved in the sixty to eighty range. With a twin turbo inline six and an eight speed, that's that's. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not saying that it's not a lot of money. Yeah, it's just everything is a lot of money. In Everything's a lot of money, but I, I get this sneaking suspicion with the Grenadier that there's good value for money there. I agree. Uh, again, like you buy the three ninety two for eighty ninety thousand dollars, and then you have to send it. Not you have to, but a lot of people then send it to AEV and they get, you know, some nicer 
interior, some different bumpers, some different wheels, some suspension, some this, some that. Um, it's done. I mean, you can get a roof rack. You can get, I mean, everything. On, you, on, you, you can yeah, literally you really just can. spec the vehicle, pretty much get in it, throw a fridge in it, drive around the world, and you're done. And it's probably good to kind of compare the Grenadier with a Wrangler. We have a lot of time in the JL and, and the JK, and they they actually are quite similar. In fact, the recent the more recent JLs have actually had a bump in payload as well. Okay. Um, so you can get a JL close to fourteen hundred pound payload, five link front and rear suspension, solid axle, body on frame. Yeah. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. What you notice most about the Grenadier is the available interior space. The yeah. overall volume of the interior mm -hmm. is significantly higher. Because you're building over the tires. That's right. Not building in between them and then adding and the roll, pretty significant the, fender flares. Yeah. The roll cage of a, of a Wrangler just... And it's got this kind of squatty roof line, which all those things make a Wrangler extremely cool. It's not yeah, to take, for sure. it's literally not to take anything away from a Wrangler, but when it comes to, I'm going to buy a box and travel with it, the Grenadier is a box that you travel in. It's literally as square as they could make it. And the interior as a, is as space efficient as they could possibly make it. So it has a lot of interior room. It reminds me a lot of, of a 110 station wagon, um, although it has a little bit more uh, yeah. length on the inside. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm fascinated. I know that, you know, from some people I can't mention, there's, there's kind of some OE solutions coming for campers and pop tops. Yeah, that's right. And, um, it, it, the aftermarket's going to hit it hard, and that's going to be the key to the yeah. success of the Grenadier is in the same way that the Wrangler is one of the most Maybe. modified vehicles. I have a differing view. Mm. I, I, I don't think... I don't think that the aftermarket needs to hit it that hard. I could, I could maybe advocate for a little bit larger tire, um, maybe a little bit more suspension height for recreational off-roading. But I think that the beauty of the Grenadier is what do you actually need? Are you just, ch are, are people, you know, just gonna like throw a bunch of LED lights and crap yep. on their Affirm card like they're, they do with Wranglers? They're going to, yeah. Yeah. They're going and, to. But, but it I doesn't, think they're missing it, it there. It doesn't need it, and I would agree with you. So we drove it on very technical yeah. terrain in Uwari, and the vehicle is on a 32-inch tall tire, the equivalent of a 32 by 1150, um, and it will easily fit a 33. So we kind of have this... It won't take a 16-inch wheel, which I think there's going to be some more evaluation around that, but it doesn't look like it'll take a 16. But it's on a 17, right? It is on a I 17, mean, which is fine. A 17 is the new... It's the new 16. If you're, if you're thinking about tire availability. And so a, a 255-80R17 will fit on this vehicle with no modification. Okay. So that's a full 33-inch tall tire. There is absolutely room in the wheel wells for a 35, like a narrow 35. So think of like the 35, 1050 Kenda. Oh yeah, you um, have those on your, your I GMC do. I've got project. them on the GMC and I love those tires. It's a great size. There needs to be a lot more options around that size because it's perfect. You don't end up with too wide of a tire, so you don't end up with a lot of raw loss in efficiency, and, and it fits in the wheel well nicely because it's the same width as the factory tire. So I think that a 35, 1050 on a 17 inch wheel on a Grenadier with about a 50 millimeter yeah. lift is going to be, it's going to go anywhere you want to go because you've got a locking rear differential, a locking center differential, a locking front differential, yeah. and a five link suspension. So the rear has a lot of articulation. The front also has a lot of articulation. Is it with, radius armed up front? No, it's not. It's five link in the front, oh, cool. just like a Wrangler. So if you were to compare a Defender 110, an original Defender 110, to the Grenadier, the Grenadier has a lot more available wheel travel and articulation. The articulation in the front is only limited by the sway bar. Mm. If you remove the factor, which we're not suggesting that people do that, but a lot of people may consider removing the front sway bar or putting a front sway bar with a different with a different uh, rating on it. Um, there is a lot of available articulation out of the front, so yeah. it'll have more articulation than the G wagon in the front. It'll have well, that's more. That's not very hard. I know exactly. <laughs> it'll have more articulation than the G wagon in the rear. 
it'll have more articulation than the Defender 110, the original classic. Mm-hmm. It'll have more articulation than a 80 series Land Cruiser because it doesn't have a radius arm front suspension. It has a five link, so it's going to be on par with articulation to a Jeep Jeep Wrangler. Yeah. And Jeep, more like a Jeep Wrangler JK. There's, there is a little bit of advantage to the JL through shock length and shock positioning that the, that the Grenadier doesn't have. And I do think that, have. that the, the Wrangler really, you know, Jeep does a great job of kind of designing for the aftermarket. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but they're different buyers, yeah. right? They um, are. They are. I, yeah. I, when, I, when I think of the Grenadier, I think of Overlanding 2010. Yeah. I think when it was more about travel than likes on Instagram, the market's broadened because of that. You know, we've both done really well. Yeah. And, you know, in disclosure. Grateful. Um, grateful. Yeah, super grateful. But um, I really think that I think that there's going to be a lot of people that miss the concept of the Grenadier yeah. because they're not really aware of. I don't want to say what real overlanding is. But it's about travel, yeah. not conquering trails. Somehow, overlanding became Hell's Revenge in Moab <laughs> when that was always, it was already called something. It was yeah. called off-roading. off-roading. Yeah, exactly. um, I, I, I think where I'm so excited about the Enios Grenadier and why, I mean, why I put my name in. So, you know, full price, no discounts, whatever, I should have by my estimation, one of the, one of the first. Yeah. I mean that the email got sent out at 11. I did know uh, the email was going to be sent out a certain time deposit put really excited. I'm going to do probably the bell staff. I think is that the trial, trial master, trial master yeah. edition, which is the name of one of the jackets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not to be confused. Some people are calling it the trail master. It is not the trail. It's trial. Just flip the. Yeah, I I uh, I ride trials. Yeah, exactly. I got I got roped into it um, from my wife's family, where everyone rides trials, including my mother-in-law. <laughs> That's um, awesome. So I had no choice. I was all into adventure bikes, you know, with yeah. my buddy Scotty and stuff. And then, you know, those are those big dumb things. That's 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 silly. And my first trial, <laughs> I thought, you know, I've had this. Bellstaff trial master uh, jacket for a long time. And I'm like, Oh, I'm going to, it's gonna be so cool. I'm going to do a trial. And it's like three <laughs> other guys there doing it. I'm it. I thought I was the snowflake here. And, um, I have not uh, lived that down in my family yet, but anyway, um, I, I'm really excited. I'm probably just going to go all out on it. Like I, I just turnkey. Like I love the idea of a turnkey vehicle with quality components and then, I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll drive one like across Africa or something yeah, or, or do something know. stupid. Um, and fully appropriate. Yeah. Fully appropriate. Cause that's what this, I think this vehicle is about. It's not about, it seems to be all go and less about the show. Oh, for sure. It's basically a box with wheels, which is how overland vehicles were always designed. Yeah, exactly. And it's got great approach angle, great departure angle, good breakover. 115 inch wheelbase so it's right between a wrangler jl unlimited and a land cruiser land cruiser is 112 yeah. the jl's at uh, almost 118 and think so. about the places that you're actually exploring these days um yeah you know in the age of the defender 110 or whatever yeah there's a dream there's places you couldn't go without modifying the vehicle you know it's the world's pretty much paved like you're you're looking for trouble Verging, verging on to, to, to justify a vehicle with traction control, huge amounts of low end torque, locking differentials, all of the things that so many vehicles these days tick the box of, you're squarely in the realm of recreational off-roading, which is great. Yeah. Not disparaging. It. I like reserve cap- capability and this vehicle totally. has it. Yeah, yeah this, this vehicle has it. But as we were talking, like the route, you know, London to Cape Town's paved now. It is. Um, you know, you can, you can drive around the world in nearly anything. Like, I've been really interested in eccentric stuff, like drive my little 68 911 short wheelbase around the world or something, because you can do that now. You, yeah, you totally um, yeah. So to look at a vehicle like this that has plenty of articulation, all of the traction aids, differentials, et, et, et cetera, yeah. and 32-inch tires, like, there's an argument that even that's overkill for, for some things. Now, if you're, if you're in... Well, there's but, an argument there. I'm not yeah. arguing that. Well, and I think I think the key now why capability matters 
in my opinion, Matt, is that there are a lot more people doing it. So like if you were to go to Sedona and try to find a camp spot, if you have like a standard level of capability, you're camped next to 22 other people. Can I start lying to people about campsites being closed in Sedona that I like? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But th that's what I like about having the additional capability is you, yeah. can get you, further, can further. you can get further away or you can take a more obscure route where you feel like you're on more of an adventure than just on a road trip. So. I should balance things by completely calling myself out um, because I, I, I have been the guy with, and I am the guy with very large tires and yeah, all of those things. So um, there's wants and there's needs and damn it, I want them. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, uh, you can submit something to our complaint box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I like reserve capability. I yeah. like reserve capacity, which means payload. This vehicle comes in at around 1,900 pounds of payload, which is Huge. way more than anything else you're going to find. 1,900 in, in pounds equipped with a lot of the things you yeah, want, right. with steel bumpers that that's right. realistically don't need to be replaced. That's right. You know, um, snorkel, all the yeah, things. Obviously, yeah. like, and this is with all manufacturers, the final payload is dependent upon the options that are selected. Yeah. Um, you know, which is which is maybe something that people think is a uh, mistake, as they'll see, oh, Ford. Ranger or Jeep Gladiator has 1,600 pounds. Well, that's sport yeah. with manual windows and this and that manual and, and, and whatever. Yeah. To have a reasonably well-equipped vehicle with that amount of payload, uh, you know, it's cool. I mean, to be fair, the Defender also, the new Defender has a it does. phenomenal payload. It does, um, absolutely. And is very capable off-road. Um, I just, you know. It's complex. So the... The thing that I think a lot of people like about the Grenadier is it's boxy, as simple mm. as you can make a vehicle in 2023. I like the little barn doors. Yep, the little barn doors are awesome. For those, yeah, I mean, let's go through the. Playing with them. I mean, just some of these are some of my takeaways from driving the vehicle. So, in the technical terrain, you've got you've got very low head toss, which also speaks to tuning of yeah, the suspension. Tuning low center gravity. That's right, and it also has. Uh, not only long travel, but good articulation overall. So the hood stays really flat. There's a couple things that I noticed that uh, throttle modulation is good, but it's a little aggressive on tip in. But this again, this is this can be something that they will change People by the time. People love they, that. They do. That is that is definitely a consumer preference. So it may not change, but you attenuate that by using left modern braking. Yeah, modern cars. You basically just you put the throttle down ten percent, and then it just yeah shifts through the gears. And Exa goes. Exactly. So a uh, little bit more throttle response on tip in has become much more common, but that is present in the Grenadier. So you're kind of missing that really long throttle travel that you would get from a classic Land Rover, mm. which is always something I really appreciated about the vehicle. Same with a, with a G-Wagon. But under left foot braking, you can attenuate all of that. Um, so I think that throttle modulation throughout the range is quite good. Brake modulation is excellent. It's not too grabby. Like we experienced that with the Defender. It was the brakes are a little grabby. Um, they're a lot more sensitive on initial application, whereas the Grenadier, very smooth brake application, really allows for left foot braking. The traction control system works quite well. In fact, I really didn't need a locker for any of it. Mm. Um, but the locker settles the vehicle down, and it also reduces trail impact. Yeah. So now we were, we were on trails that were intentionally meant to be, you know. Private property. That's yeah. right. Um, off-road course so when you're driving regular trails you always want to engage four-wheel drive and engage the lockers as appropriate to minimize trail damage but um, the lockers turn on and off really easy it's right on the overhead console mm. big fat switches you could do it with a gloved hand it's cool yeah it's super easy it does have an off-road mode that you can go into it changes some screens and changes some of the algorithms around the traction control um, the traction control is a little less effective under left foot braking, so hopefully that's something that they address. Uh, the traction control in off-road mode should not be reduced in effectiveness under left foot braking. So you want it to stay the same, uh, like an A-Track or something like yeah. that that you'd see in Toyota. 
What I noticed uh, when I was driving it at kind of moderate, uh, moderate to higher speeds on the dirt was that you notice a little bit of that payload. So it's a little firmer in mm. the rear suspension, which again, there's a the reason for that. The only way you're going to get rid of that right. is airbags. Yeah or, or, yeah, or you just load it up with your gear and then yeah. it's going to drive great. So um, for those that are driving one unloaded, it's going to be a little firmer in the rear, but there's a reason for it. That's how you get the payload. Yep. So, and it is a... These are iBox Springs, progressive rate. They've done everything that they can to address that. But it's the nature of, like, if you hop into a 3500 Ram, the ride quality in the rear is going to be a little firm because yep. it's meant to carry a bunch of stuff. So uh, just be aware of that when you drive the vehicle. It's not, a, um, it's not an issue. It's actually intentional. So a little bit firmer in the rear. Uh, I thought the steering was surprisingly direct for a solid axle. Um, you know, a lot of you don't want it to be circulating ball. I that's suppose. right. Yeah. It is, and you don't want it to be too direct because it leads to a lot of driver fatigue. This isn't a sports car, so we're not trying to be super precise in the way that the steering responds. So, I thought it was a nicely weighted steering, and I thought that the it was appropriately direct. It, yeah. it didn't feel vague like. Older Land Cruisers in the 70 series, pretty vague. Uh, this is less vague, uh, but just the right amount. So I think the two areas, you know, we've, 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 we've sung the praises of the vehicle, how we want it to succeed. Let's get into the dirty. <laughs> we have to, right? We, yeah, have sure. to, we have to balance. So the things that really concern me are, um, I mean, uh, to get off the bat, the build quality, right? I haven't experienced it, but whenever a new car company comes onto the scene, mm. regardless of, um, you know, the, the engineering consultants and suppliers and whatever, um, you know, there are divisions at Stellantis that work on switch gear and, you know, noise, vibration, harshness and, and all of these things. Um, how did you feel the build quality of the vehicle was? Um, and then after that, I want to, I do want to dwell a little bit on, you know, the, the, the service network of it. Yeah. Um, cause I know again, to compare it to a Jeep, I mean, or even a Land Rover there, there, there's a, there's a dealer network. Yeah. There's, there's currently zero announced dealers from what I'm aware of with Ineos. Yeah. We can talk about the things that I know about both of those things. So I did ask the question, uh, they had some, Ineos personnel there that were related to after sales and um, some of the systems. And I asked that question. And the, the, the way that I look around build quality is that it's built in a Mercedes plant. So it was a prior Mercedes plant hmm. in Hambach, France, designed by Magnus Steyr. So, and it's also very simple. Hmm. So I, as far as my experience driving the vehicle, I had very little of that kind of plastic squeakiness going on. Yeah. I didn't have any rattles, very little of the plastic squeakiness going on. Not, so, not that you can't get that with a major company. I mean, I think Fords do that for me as, you know, like every little edge has a, has yeah. a mold seam line or whatever. Yeah, I That's think... That's cost cutting, but... I, I think that the, the vehicle has an advantage around it being very simple. Yeah. And I think the fact that it's made in a Mercedes a prior Mercedes plant. They use a lot of the same employees designed by Magnus Steyr. I think those are things that help it to come across as build quality. It's also not intended to be a, a cheap vehicle. So they are building it for a, a more affluent consumer. I, so. am, I am so surprised that they don't have a Mercedes engine in it because there are, yeah. there are increasing ties between Ineos and Mercedes whether that's through, uh, you know, their sailing efforts. Yeah. Um, they're both, you know, supporters of the Mercedes AMG F1 team. Um, well, it was would, cool to see Lewis know. Hamilton driving one of these things, uh, which absolutely. I thought was maybe a little bit of a conflict, but Mercedes was okay with it. I think it was great. Well, may, and maybe you know the answer to this. Does Mercedes have a program like that where they sell their engines out to other manufacturers? They, they do. Um, the, the best known example of it probably would be Aston Martin. Oh, okay. Um, so they wow. have a, so the same, the same engine that's in the E63 S wagon that that's, I lent you. It's insane. Which is 
It's insane. It makes no sense. Yeah. It's literally insane. If you get a chance to drive an E63 S wagon. Yeah, it's and insane. Did you launch it though? I don't think you launched it. No, I, I mean, it's your car. So I like, no, but, but, I, but it doesn't mean I didn't it's, get it's on under it. warranty. I mean, you, I know it, it was it's, insane. It's so crazy. It was insane. anyway, but it's the same motor. It's, it's their four liter, um, bi turbo. It's kind of a hot V yeah. style. So they farm that engine out to a lot of people. Um, and, and, and I can see why it's unbelievable. And, and, I thought it was like, this thing is so fast. And then I realized that there's like a whole nother like l stage of the accelerator that I never had gotten into. And then it was like, blah, you know, anyway, if I had like, any hair. I, it I, been I'm gone. just, I'm just curious to see like with, with these increasing ties between those two companies and, and the things that they sponsor. Yeah. Um, especially when you have a company like, like Ineos. And I think that this is an interesting thing to talk about is where the company is going to go. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't have to report to shareholders. Like that's the thing that's is right. Ineos is one of the largest privately owned companies in the world. Yeah, that's right. I think it's the largest privately owned company in the United Kingdom. Correct me if I'm wrong, could be wrong. Um, but take Jeep, yep. part of the Stellantis group, which is owned, well, which is now, you know, Fiat, uh, Peugeot, conglomerate, uh, publicly traded, Land Rover, publicly traded. Um, all of these companies that they're is competing. Is Land Rover publicly traded? Through Tata, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I didn't know if so, Tata was privately held. No. Um, the Tata family. So I'm not sure what stock exchange you're listed on, but yeah, sure. I believe that they're public. Um, it's, it's the, the cool thing here is it's a vision of one person. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's one person driving it. There's one person that's going to use it. There's, you know, well, there's many people are going to use it, but there's, there's the guy at the top is motivated for it to be successful because it's in essence a, I don't want to call it a passion project because that is like something you do when you open a coffee shop. But yeah, um, the point being that they don't really have anybody else to answer to aside from one guy. Yeah. Obviously he wants to be profitable. Obviously he doesn't want to lose his ass on it. Um, but it's like, what, what happens next for this vehicle? You know, cause where it's at now. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see a, like a crew cab truck version. What, what happens when the Rubicon of this comes yeah, out? And that's, I mean, they're the SVR they're like, version of this. They're likely going to do that. I, I mean, I don't know. I have no information to that extent. But th why not? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you have a more an even more capable variant of that? And I think people will be looking for it. I think that they're gonna they're gonna be very surprised by how high the ticket price can be of this vehicle with the right packages. Um, but I also am really grateful the fact that you can buy us like a stock standard one yeah. still, yeah. um, with, without a lot of options. Cause it, that'll also take you around the world. So I drove most of the course without putting the lockers on and yeah. the times that I did was just to test their capabilities. So you're going to be able to go anywhere you want, even mm. without the locker version. So yeah, as, as far as the, the build quality, my initial impressions were quite good and it's because it is very simple. Yeah. Like. This, the, again, the seats, no electronics in the seats, the dash, like there's actually no gauge pod other than this very small little like vestigial warning pod that's in front mm. of the driver. The only thing on the dash is this screen that ha it's in the center and it shows all the things. Yeah. So there's just not much to go wrong. Um, but I do suspect, like I think about my G wagon after 30 something years there were, there were some squeaks and rattles, but not many. Yeah. And I think it'll probably be similar to that. The dealer network is the big unknown mm. and it's going to be really important that they get that right. It's going to be important that they get the experience right when someone has a problem that they're taking care of. Yeah. yeah I, I did a lot of research on this motor and there is not like, like there's examples of them going hundreds of thousands of miles. <laughs> it's literally, there's not like some, there's some concerns around like the early Vanos systems and stuff, but yeah. but that has a, a lot of that's been addressed. So yeah. it's really. A lot, I mean, a lot of that was pioneering technology that is now relatively commonplace. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. You know, and then when you think about it as an overland vehicle, the the one thing that I noticed was the rear seats when they fold down. They don't, the whole floor isn't flat. So ah, you end up of death for dog people. Uh, well, well, the, when they flip forward, the door, the floor is flat. But then how does your dog put his head on the center console and you give yeah, him that? So, so I think that 
someone's going to need to come up with like a low profile drawer system that ends up with this perfectly flat mm. floor back there. Cause you got to be able to sleep in these things. It is long enough to sleep in, which is really important. It has a pretty high roof line. So you end up, you know, being able to kind of sleep inside the vehicle. So that's something that I, that I like. Um, it, you know, it's going to have an auxiliary battery option cool. from the factory, which is kind of cool. And the batteries are underneath the passenger seats in the second row. So they're very low and, and centralized, center mass, yeah. centralized. So that's kind of cool. Um, so I think, I think we're going to be pretty pleased with this thing under, under most circumstances. Um, you know, it's not going to be as capable as a Wrangler, but it's going to be pretty close. Cool. Well, I can't wait to drive it. Hopefully we I'm do sure some stupid things. I'm sure that'll happen soon. Yeah. yeah I'm, I think we're going to, have some announcements here soon that we can share. So cool. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. We got a riff on Grenadier. I mean, imagine, I mean, think about it. It is 2023 and we just got to talk about a new car company that's introducing a body on frame, solid axle four wheel drive, uh, which you know, is I, like, I, it's I, like I think it would have never imagined. I think if you're in the position to support it, it probably makes sense to at least give it a try. Right. Yeah, I mean, sure. how many of us have sat around the campfire and said, I wish somebody would make a vehicle like this. Nobody gets it. They're not offering this. Well, now somebody is. Yep. So, um, and the worst thing that can happen is people don't step up to support it. If you don't, if you don't support your local new restaurant, they close. If you don't support exactly. the company that's actually making the car you've been screaming about for the last 20 mm -hmm. years. Um, and we're not telling people obviously to go buy new vehicles, but it's just more like if you yeah, have stay within your means and, and, yeah, and stay do within your means for but, you, but yeah, if we don't support people who are doing cool stuff, then you know we don't get we don't get cool toys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, cool. Thanks, Matt. Until next time. Yeah, and so yeah, and then we've got a a full article on Expedition Portal on the first drive of the Grenadier. We also have on YouTube um, a, a first drive video that shows a lot of the off road performance that we just talked about. Uh, so check those out on the Expedition Portal YouTube channel. And until next time. We'll talk to you.